Um, my name is Ingrid. I'm new to this. This is, I think, I, my fourth uh, session. Hang on there. I, sorry, I, I muted myself. And uh, my question, I'm very new at this, very green. So if this is not the proper forum for this question, just let me know. But um, I'm reading, I just started reading The Compass of Zen. And I don't know if it's in the introduction or the foreword or the foreword to the foreword or what, but um, Zen master Seung Sang talks about um, how the root of our problems as humans is the fact that we eat meat and that animals, um, have, there's been so many of them killed for us to eat that their spirits are reincarnating in people and that's giving us an animal nature instead of a human nature. Um, well, first of all, I'm not a vegan and I'm not sure I believe in reincarnation. I'm trying to keep an open mind about everything. Uh, but I would assume that having a animal spirit would be better because they definitely have don't know minds. They eat when they're hungry. They hunt when they need to. They sleep when they need to. They procreate. They do everything by instinct. Uh, however, apparently that's not the case. I don't know. Uh, and that's a good thing, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm curious as to your take on whether you can have an effective practice. If he's building the entire compass of Zen on the fact that um, he believes in reincarnation and being a vegan, can you have an effective practice without believing in those things or being a vegan? That's all I got. <laughs> So welcome everybody to Sunday practice. Uh, before I answer your question, Ingrid, I'd like to uh, congratulate everybody and actually thank everybody who yesterday took precepts. So these uh, precepts are a kind of technique and a very important technique because you'll notice as Jacob discovered when he actually read them <laughs> that uh, uh, they uh, point you in a particular direction so that you can be helpful for this world rather than uh, a negative thing, right? So uh, when the Buddha discovered uh, suffering, the suffering of the world, he noticed that, uh, that a lot of that suffering is uh, created by, well, that suffering is created by our minds and a lot of the stuff that we do in this world actually create suffering. So um, originally, this is a while after he got enlightenment, he created these precepts to point us in a particular direction. So the way to think about these precepts is uh, they're pointing you towards uh, being, not just uh, taking away the negative things like Jacob was talking about anger, or you could talk about killing things to eat them or whatever. Human beings are very skillful at creating ways to uh, hurt other people and hurt the world, whether it's the air, the water, the soil, or other human beings, of course. So he developed these uh, precepts as a technique to point us in a particular direction. So that's why I want to thank everybody for taking these precepts, because what you're doing is committing yourself to actually helping the world rather than hindering it. So uh, that's very important, no matter what the level of precepts are, you know. So there's five precepts, then uh, Jacob took 10 precepts, Ali retook 10 precepts, um, then there's 16 precepts, then there's 48 precepts, and then there's 250 precepts, and then there's 350 precepts. So that covers a lot of the bases with respect to bad stuff that human beings can do. So if you uh, take those to heart and have them as kind of road signs pointing you down the road of life, that's, uh, what, that's their intention. Right? So the important thing is uh, uh, what you're doing. So um, uh, one way to think about uh, 
uh, eating meat is, uh, well, we, we have this intention uh, not to hurt the world, right? But you'll notice that uh, uh, there's probably a lot of soybeans in the world that wish that we weren't eating their babies, right? So behind that meat or rice plants or wheat plants or anything else. So behind that, again, is this big intention. So actually it's, uh, yeah, what you eat is important, certainly for your health and also for your mind and it's also for your intention about helping the world. But there's this bigger thing back behind and that is, uh, what do you do with the energy that you get, right? So if I eat a, if I eat uh, tofu, I could use that energy to rob a bank, actually, if it wasn't clear what my intention was, right? So I don't know how many uh, vegan bank robbers there are in the world. Probably Bonnie and Clyde weren't tofu eaters. But um, the important thing is the thing back behind. What is your intention? You know, I remember being shocked when I heard that the Dalai Lama ate meat, right? What? The Dalai Lama eats meat, right? And, uh, but again, it's, it's the big intention that's behind the action. So all of these are our techniques, right? And so the precepts say, you know when to break them, when they're open and when they're closed, right? So uh, you might even kill another person out of love and compassion for the world. I, I could contrive a situation for you and present it as an example of something where uh, killing another person might be the thing to do out of compassion, right? So it's always this big intention back behind. And these superficial, these more superficial things, they're not superficial, these less, these upfront things, these practical things uh, are important, but you always want to keep this big intention in mind back behind, right? So that's, uh, that's the meaning behind veganism or the meaning behind vegetarianism or even the me meaning behind eating meat is, well, what, what are you actually doing with that energy that you get? So you breathe air, right? So you have to breathe air all the time. So what are you doing with the energy that you get from breathing air? And then you're eating all the time. What are you actually doing with the energy that you get from eating that food? So everything's connected to everything else. So, I mean, just think about it. If you eat a, if you eat a hamburger, you're probably eating meat by, from an animal that ate corn, soybeans, perhaps millet, it also, so everything is connected to everything else. So that connectedness is the basis of our love and compassion for all beings, because we're all interconnected and we need to treat them all with love and compassion. And the fact that we are here is because of this interconnectedness, right? So in Zen, we call that becoming one. So you have to become one moment to moment to moment. So that's, that's the meaning of love and compassion because we are actually are one uh, with everything. And there's no way that you're going to be alive without being part of that one thing. Now you can think you're not part of it, right? But that's just thinking. So it's very important not to attach to your thinking so you can clearly see that direction, right? So uh, uh, eating meat or not eating meat, eating soybeans, not eating soybeans. Uh, yeah, that's a consideration, but you always wanna keep your eyes on the uh, big thing. I always say, keep your eye on the ball. You know, it's kind of a, uh, a golfing metaphor. <laughs> But sometimes we, we get so wrapped up in our religious idea, maybe, right? Or we get all wrapped up in our uh, uh, attachment, maybe to the precepts or to these robes. No, you can't see it, but I have on a really nice robe here. So <laughs> we can get attached to anything. I mean, you know, the human mind is like Velcro. It'll stick to anything. 
even this idea that we're a holy, wonderful person helping the world. Well, oh, I'm so wonderful, <laughs> right? So you can attach to anything. So it's very important not to attach to anything. But you're not attaching. You're not not attaching to anything for you. You're not attaching to something to help the world. So behind that is actually what we call big attachment. So the Buddha. Even the Buddha, after he got enlightenment, right, he kept sitting underneath the tree and a god had to float down to heaven and say, hey, wait a minute, you didn't get enlightenment to sit underneath the tree and groove on being enlightened, right? You, you have to use this to help the world. So it's all about suffering and helping the world. So in the end, the Buddha had to get up and go do something, help the world, right? So uh, yesterday we had an Enlightenment Day ceremony at the Zen Center in Milwaukee. So that's called the Enlightenment Day ceremony. So uh, it's kind of interesting because I hadn't been to an Enlightenment Day ceremony for 10 years because I live in Singapore, right, for the last 10 years. So in Singapore, they uh, celebrate Visak Day, which happens in the spring. So Visak is uh, three Buddhist holidays put together as one. It's part of the Theravadan tradition. So uh, that's Buddha's birth, Buddha's enlightenment, and, bird, and Buddha's death, right? So they celebrate them all at once. But in Mahayana Buddhism, we pull them apart, right? So there's an enlightenment day, there's a Buddha's birthday, uh, well, there isn't any death day thing. So we pull them apart. But yesterday I got to do enlightenment day, but then I was thinking, well, wait a minute, what, uh, that, why, there's a more important thing than enlightenment, and of course that's getting up and helping the world. So you're not getting enlightenment to get enlightenment. You're getting so-called getting enlightenment. It's about getting up and helping the world. So I had this really brilliant idea. I should, I should be a Buddhist theologian. Uh, so I was thinking about, well, we should have a new holiday. We should have a get up day. Right? That would be the important one to celebrate in my mind. Right. So no matter what all this religious stuff is, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, or some native religion. Right. So what's important is not all the superficial stuff. You know, we can wear feathers, we can wear robes, we can dress in yellow, brown or black. Uh, what's important is the behind meaning. And the behind meaning is how can I help the world? How can we help the world? So that's what's behind uh, eating meat or not eating meat. Where, where are these robes or those robes? Uh, whether you're uh, practice Korean Buddhism or Chinese Buddhism or Burmese Buddhism or Vietnamese Buddhism or whatever the heck it is, all that is just the surface stuff. So don't attach to the surface stuff and don't forget the big behind meaning, which is we're here to help the world. So that's what we call great attachment or big attachment. So it's not even about not having any attachments. It's about being clear about the direction of your life. Okay, so uh, how do you use all these smaller little things to uh, get towards this uh, big goal? That's the important thing. So thank you for your question. And I want to thank everybody for taking those precepts. That's, uh, uh, that's the best. That's a really good ceremony. Any other questions? Nick Wonsonim? Yes. You talked about um, just now about getting up and helping this world and how that's so the most important thing. So I have been struggling over probably the past six months with my practice, just uh -huh. I think because of everything that's going on. I'm oh, just yeah. tired and stressed. Right. What is your suggestion for kind of jump starting and getting getting back into it more right. simply? So uh, my theory is that uh, the Buddha got tired <laughs> and sick of the whole thing, you know, like 40 years of trying to help people and God, it doesn't work. People are still acting up, right? <laughs> it's kind of like Jacob talking about his dogs. No matter what he does to those dogs, those dogs are still going to act up, right? But it's still his job to take care of them, even if they are acting up, right? His job is somewhere else. So uh, one thing is, uh, what made the Buddha practice? He sees suffering, right? Old age, sickness, and death. Uh, so that's the, that's the real motivation behind practicing. 
Also, you don't want to be attached to practice, right? So, so you, you've probably met people like this that are very attached to either the forms of practice, the techniques of practice. Uh, I practice I practice Korean song. I don't practice East. I don't practice Japanese Zen. I'm sorry. You know? So uh, people can get attached to it rather than seeing the big meaning. So usually what happens when I get tired of practicing, I know I'm getting, oh, my leg hurts. I'm so tired of sitting cross-legged. It's such boring crap. You know, I could be watching the latest episode of Bosch. It's, it, is it out yet? I, I want to see that on Netflix or whatever. Prime. I'm on Prime. So, <laughs> you know, so you get to you usually get distracted. Everybody gets distracted. It's natural. So you always want to come back to this great vow. And it's the suffering that actually motivated the Buddha, right? Before he was floating through some kind of uh, regal, celestial, uh, imperial world where he was on top and he was the, he was one of the big dogs. And then, but old age, sickness and death, well, wait a minute, even if I am the next king of England, I'm going to die. So uh, Prince Charles should be careful because <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you know, he's almost as old as me. God. <laughs> so well, but if you look behind that, you know, that's your reason for practicing because that's the source of our, that's uh, what makes human beings suffer because they're attached to something and that's something that is going to go away soon. So it has to do with intention. So uh, Maybe you don't like Korean chanting, or maybe you don't like, like some, uh, some people like practicing on Zoom, or some people only like practicing in a Japanese Zen hall because it doesn't have all the crap in it that the Chinese one or the Korean one has. So, you know, your mind is always making this junk all the time. So it's very important not to attach to all that crap and to keep clear why you're going forward. So. What you're experiencing is natural. In fact, it probably happens to everybody here on the screen moment to moment, but you have to be able to let go of that so you can return to your original intention. So that's this great intention. That's why you're doing it. You're not doing it because you like Korean robes and you don't like Japanese black robes. And I, I really don't like Burmese monks robes. You know? You're not doing it because of that. Those are all the, uh, what we might call the techniques, right? So uh, don't attach to any of that stuff. Keep your mind on the big show and boom, do it. So that's what we call just do it. So it's interesting because just do it means you do it if you don't like it. Like, I don't like Zoom, right? But, you know, before, a couple of weeks ago, I didn't like Zoom. Now, this week, I like Zoom. <laughs> so it doesn't make any difference. Whether you like it, you don't like it, or you feel neutral about it, you just do it. Boom. Right? So that's just do it. That's don't know mind's job is to just do it. You know, those are not states of being. Those are doing it. So we're the do it school. And that's why Zen Master Sung Song translated this Japanese phrase, Wu Wei, by which means uh, uh, no attachment action as just do it, which then the Nike people stole. Anyway, it's a brilliant translation. Anyway, this is enough blah, blah, blah about today. So most important is just do it. And thank you all for practicing and helping the Zen Center, because let me tell you, that helps the world in one of the most important ways that I can think of, but I'm not very smart. So thank you all for doing that.